and gentlemen, what is up? Welcome to Marketing Monday on Monday, September 11th, 2023. Never forget is what we'd say. And marketers are the first to heed that call. Let's talk a little bit about that. You see, over the years, since a national tragedy befell the American populace in 2001, marketers have decided it is their place to make the most tasteful memorials to 3,000 people dying, including this Coca-Cola Walmart display set up as the twin towers in front of a flag with We Will Never Forget with $3.33 pricing. Or maybe it was this European ad about smoking where they compared smoking to the twin towers. Having seen a lot of these absolutely terrible ads, the one that stood out over all time to me was this one from just a few years after where they were trying to sell mattresses. Right now you can get any size mattress for a twin price. Full mattress. Twin price. Queen mattress. Twin price. King mattress. Twin price. Store wide sale all day long. <laughs> We'll never forget. I have to pause there. That delivery of her saying we'll never forget is burned into my brain for like the past 10 years. That little smirk and that would save it, would make it tasteful. It's insane. It's insane. Anyway, I thought, you know, it's been a few years since they've seen anything like this. I think all the companies involved, all three of these companies got significant public blowback. And so I thought no company would make that mistake again. Well, let's start off this week <laughs> with a big wrong from me. Because as of today, DraftKings created the 9-11 Never Forget Parlay Bet. <laughs> Where if all three New York teams win, you get like a bonus. Absolutely insane. The uh, blowback was immediate. They apologized, took down the bet, and got uh, smoked for it on social media. But speaking of gambling, you know, I don't want to talk too much about 9-11 on 9-11. I just wanted to say, I don't know when marketers will learn. I've realized that I am doing too many fails on this show, and I get a lot of pushback for it. So I decided I don't want it to be my choice. So... I had Billary Squinton, a member of the community, create a new system where it'll simply gamble to figure out who goes first. Do I start with a win or do I start with a fail? Let's find out. Let's go! Let's start with a win. I will bring you back to 1997 to one of my favorite ads as a child. Where's the cream filling? If you are four million years old like me, you probably remember Hostess, that's the stuff, a popular snack. They make Twinkies, Ho-Os, cupcakes, and more. Well, guess what? They had a big win today <laughs> because this might look like a crypto stock or a meme stock that just surged by like 40% in a day. It turns out it's not. It's the Hostess company who were just bought by Smuckers for $5.6 billion. Now this is well more than Hostess was currently worth. Again, just a few months ago, Hostess was probably worth conservatively about $3.2 billion. Nearly double was this buyout. And I wanted to figure out why. Why would they pay so much for Smuckers to get into the, you know, slightly dated snack foods business? First of all, Smuckers has been on an acquisition spree, which if you don't know, every single food company that's left in the world, and especially in America, owns basically 900 brands. <laughs> Smuckers, you thought it might be a jelly company, but in fact, they bought Folgers for $3 billion a while back. They bought pet food, uh, as in milk bone, <laughs> pepperoni, meow mix, uh, and more uh, for $3.2 billion. They bought all of the brands seen here and now are spending you know, $5.6 billion, a lot of it debt, to get into owning Twinkies. Twinkies and host of other, other products. But the reason the number was so high is because there was a bidding war, okay? It turns out there's these little Twinkies are in hot demand. General Mills, owner of probably every cereal you've ever tried, and Mondelez International, owner of Oreos, were both two of the bidders that were spurned that helped drive this price up from 3.2 billion to 5.6 billion. And, and their CEO had to explain to the market why he thought winning this bidding war was so important. Because again, billions of dollars for a snack food company is, is it's not like a tech company, man. That money matters. They spend that much money at that point. So he said they had three plans. They had three reasons for making this big investment. Number one was shelf space. You see, if you already own jelly, coffee, dog food, etc., and now you own a ton of the brands seen here, Donuts, Hostess, Twinkies, etc., you can play hardball with stores. Basically, you can say, we have so many of the products, give us the best shelf space, or we'll pull all our products, and your consumers will be pissed. Number two is that they have the Uncrustables. <laughs> Smuckers apparently didn't know how great snack food was for making money until they launched the Uncrustables, which I'm sure a lot of you are weirdly into. <laughs> Apparently, once they made the Uncrustables and started making a $1 billion brand, these things sell $4 million a day. 
They realize snack food rules. You basically take like cheap ingredients, package it, sell it at a pretty huge markup. People buy it over and over and over again and the sales keep going up. People love the Uncrustables and now they're trying to get into that. And they think, this might be their CEO just kind of like spinning, but apparently they believe the food engineers over at Hostess are gonna help them come up with new exciting ways to make Uncrustables fun for the consumer. <laughs> <laughs> like smaller Uncrustables or lower calorie Uncrustables or Uncrustables minis or <laughs> different sizes. Okay, I don't know, but that's what they think. I guess that's worth 5.6 billion. Also, I don't know if you noticed, but ever since that 1997 ad, there hasn't been that many Hostess ads. They don't spend on marketing. And that's probably because Hostess has gone through two bankruptcies in the past 10 years, which makes their price tag all the more insane. So uh, anyway, Smuckers thinks they can spend a lot on marketing and help get consumers to know more about the beautiful Twinkie and Snowball brands and buy more. But the real reason, if you zoom out, the real reason there's such a frenzy for all of these companies to buy up any available sort of land and as you could say, in the snacking space, is that snacking, especially in America, is more popular than ever. All of the stats show that US diets have become snackified. Girl dinner is not just a meme. People are eating snacks instead of meals. Kellogg's, as of two hours ago, confirmed in a press release they are splitting their company into two separate companies. Kellogg's Co. for cereals and the stuff they already did, and Kellanova, which is only for snacks. They are making a Kellanova separate company Company focused entirely on snacks like Pringles and Cheez-Its and other things they control. And of course, the marketing bad names get worse because this one really had me scratching my head. This is from Nestle, who have decided to try to coin the term smeals. <laughs> to refer to small meals or sizable snacks. I think we just called these snacks. <laughs> now, all of this stuff is interesting and you could say it's just changing consumer tastes. But I think if you look into it, there seems to be somewhat of an economic reason as well. Same store sales at groceries are down outside of snacks and snacks are that some of the cheapest things on offer. And it feels like people are just finding cheaper and cheaper ways to get calories into their body. I'm not as positive on it as these companies seem to be, even though they see dollar signs. And again, the, the main trend of it seems to align with the consumer groups that have less money, millennials and Gen Z. They say it's due to their busier lifestyles, but I, <laughs> I mean, maybe. That being said, it's not all bad news. More importantly, we're getting stuff targeted to our demographics, millennials and Gen Z, specifically to gamers with the brand new RGB gamer friendly cup noodles. Let's go. Now, what makes it gamer friendly? Well, first the RGB branding, amazing. But more importantly, <laughs> is that this ramen is different from any other ramen you've ever had because this one is caffeinated. <laughs> caffeinated cup noodles so you can game all night. All that being said, you know, all of this explanation, all of the growth in snacking is real, but the price for buying Hostess, which started this all, is really high. And the market does not believe they paid the right price because even though Hostess stock surged when it found that they were being acquired, Smuckers, who are doing the acquiring, tanked the exact same amount. <laughs> Anyway, we'll see how it plays out. Uh, speaking of stocks that are declining, I do wanna talk about the biggest stock in the world, Apple. Apple has tumbled 200 billion. Now, by the way, $200 billion, when you see it from Apple, seems like not a lot of money. $200 billion is like two Nikes. It's like a McDonald's worth of companies that is just in a two days was gone. Apple is such a big company. Even the small movements are massive. Apple has tumbled $200 billion in two days because of a Chinese crackdown on iPhone use. See, Apple is the world's most valuable company. It is currently worth more than Tesla, McDonald's, Exxon Mobil, Samsung, Walmart, Disney, and Nike combined. And it's holding up a lot of the market. You see this year, we have not had many stocks go up other than the Magnificent Seven, largely led by Apple. But now China, in response to tech blockades from America has been cracking down on iPhone use for government officials. Now you might not think that's that big of a deal. Again, government officials can't be that many people, but it turns out there are so many state, first of all, employees, government employees and state controlled businesses in China. This reflects almost 60 million people, potentially, potentially 60 million people that can no longer buy iPhones. And again, they're trying to broaden it. 
So there's other agencies like, like Petro China, oil companies, they're only loosely state affiliated. China seeking to expand the ban. If this were to come true or even lead to a broader movement where Chinese people are distrusting of Apple or feel like it's unpatriotic to buy Apple products, this could be bad. You see, Apple is about to release a new iPhone and the iPhone is half of all their money. Plus it leads to more sales and wearables, services and the whole ecosystem. And its sales in China have been its highest growth area since 2019. And it's $70 billion and it's it's a fifth of Apple's revenue. So if, if China is not a growing and important place for Apple iPhones, that's really bad for the company. That's like very, very risky and shaky. And so they're advertising there and they're hoping to smooth things over specifically because not only do they sell a bunch of iPhones there, but they also make them there. <laughs> what will happen? We don't know, but the iPhone brand could spread. See, office workers in China are now worried they may be next, as in offices for companies that are not state affiliated might start asking employees or suggesting or uh, further to ban iPhones. A blanket ban is not currently announced, and this depends on how well Tim Cook can manage it. Now, I don't want to be doom and gloom here on Apple. Obviously, a ton of their business is done in China. We'll see how it plays out. But for the rest of the world, it actually, I looked into it, it turns Turns out Apple is doing really well. They are kind of beating the pants off Android in the past few years. Basically half of all Americans, no matter what economic class you're in, use iPhone. And 88% of teens use iPhone. Young people use iPhone at an astronomical rate. There's a story of like a 14 year old kid whose dad was taking him to buy his first cell phone. And the kid said, if you don't give me an iPhone, I'd rather have no phone because kids will make fun of my green bubbles. <laughs> So and, and, yeah, the sales have been up is what I'm trying to say. In the past few years, specifically, Apple has made significant inroads. And every year it slips a little bit more because it turns out that once you get into the Apple ecosystem, it's very hard to get out. I don't want to make fun of them. Again, I, I am a lowly poor Android user. They are announcing a big phone tomorrow and they have $47 billion R&D budget into it. They spent $47 billion last year on the R&D for this iPhone. As far as I can tell, the major innovation is to go from 172 grams to 170. 71 grand, which is oppressive, okay? By the iPhone 170, we're gonna be at a weightless phone. And Tim Cook might be the only CEO in the world who is possibly underpaid, <laughs> given that he manages the largest company in the world and is paid way less than people like David Zaslav. He is successfully managing to balance the fact that he needs China to not be mad at him while simultaneously moving a lot of production to India so he can be safe from restrictions while keeping iPhone sales continuing to grow year over year. He's doing a pretty decent job. I'll be impressed. And on the other side, despite all of these uh, challenges facing Apple, as far as I can tell, the only innovation coming out of the Android side in the past year is that a few days ago, they announced they're changing the logo. <laughs> they're, they're adding a more cute robo guy and making the font a little different. They want to remind you more of Google and have more cute poses for, I forget the guy's name. He's like RoboDroid. So, I mean, you know, I, I can see why market share is slipping away, but gray hair and all is actually not in his 80s, but he's not the only old person working. I want to talk about a little bit about old people continuing to work because it turns out more Americans than ever are working into their 80s. This could be teachers like this guy, garment workers like this guy, people working in some sort of political office, lovable streamers in America are continuing to work well into their 80s. And the stats bear this out. You see, this is the percent change in civilian labor force by age. The light blue is the increase in 75 and over continuing to work uh, in the labor force. You'll notice it was the largest growth in the past 10 years and is presumed to be massive in the next 10. As America continues to age and we have fewer kids because the fertility rate has dropped, we're gonna have more and more old people continuing to be in the workforce. So uh, there's more reasons given. Some of them are people are healthier than they used to be. <laughs> you know, people are, people are living a little longer. It gives old people a sense of purpose, sure. But I think more realistically, this one at the top is by far the standout, which is financial need. There's more old people than ever before, and the, the median retirement savings is about 150,000, which is not nearly enough to live your last few decades on in America. And it says when possible, working longer can help stretch these dollars. Even the wealthy, it shows, who have higher income outcomes, they have about 535,000, which is not enough to sustain a decades long retirement. So people are kind of being forced to work longer and longer, which is obviously a huge win because working is great. <laughs> you can always do the thing you love for years and years and years. So that's fine, but it remains to be seen. 
And the reason working longer is so great is because you get smarter. And that's why I want to give a big win to our old pal, David Zaslav, a CEO who's still killing it because he, again, comes to this show with great marketing and business news. This is a big win for one group in particular, and that is millennials, baby, because he believes that Harry Potter and Lord of the Rings are underused. His plan to turn around a company that is very much struggling. You see, Warner Brothers is about to take a 300 to 500 million dollar earnings hit due to the strikes. They have no movies coming out. HBO Max is losing subscribers. And so his plan is this. Let's make more Harry Potter and more Lord of the Rings. <laughs> This is why he's on top. This is why he is the leader in Hollywood, dude. And that's interesting because when I look into it, I see eight Harry Potter movies followed by three more Harry Potter movies <laughs> followed by an upcoming Harry Potter TV show. So I don't know, in my mind, I wasn't sure that that was very underused. And then I saw literally hundreds of DC movies, TV shows, spinoffs, you know, properties, the last six of which are all flops. I don't know if that's necessarily underused. And when I look at Lord of the Rings, I see that they had three all-time classic movies, and they followed that up by taking the shortest book in the series <laughs> and splitting that into three movies <laughs> to try and milk the most out of it, and they're following it with more. So I don't know that it feels like it's currently being underused. These are things that are already in the work. I don't see how he's gonna squeeze more blood from this stone, but I'm excited to see him try. Now I am going to do something I have never done on this show before. Usually when we get about to the near the end of wins and fails, I like to talk about China. I go to the Far East and I do a segment called Was Up Beijing? But there was so much geopolitical news this week, I couldn't fit it into one segment. And so I chose three separate countries, starting with a segment about Great Britain. Now, normally I get a funny clip of a world leader when I introduce their country. For Britain, I wanted to find one for Rishi Sunak, who's the current prime minister. <laughs> and so with 30 seconds of Googling, I found this clip of him working at a soup kitchen. What question do you think he asked this man? What, what do you have a, do you work in a business? Do you want some no, fruit? No, I'm, I'm homeless. <laughs> Is that a normal question to ask when you're volunteering at a soup kitchen? Uh, here in the good old UK. Let's see what's been going on. Well, firstly, their second largest city, Birmingham, is going bankrupt because it doesn't want to give women any money. Apparently they have been underpaying all female government employees for the past, I don't know, forever. And then they lost a lawsuit about that and had to pay them back wages to equal the gap. It can't afford that. And so it is declaring the entire city bankrupt. In other great UK news, there's been some strikes happening and the UK government didn't like that. So they are starting to create a new series of strike laws. Basically, if I could summarize it, the companies or the government services that are being striked against can tell certain employees they are not allowed to strike. They can just make certain employees have to scab and work. And if they don't do that, they could be fired, terminated for any reason. And if a union strikes against the company and the company feels like it's lost profits unfairly, they can sue the union? <laughs> which is apparently part of these new strike laws, which are now being reported to the UN to try and get around the UK government and see if they can find some way to stop this. But that's what's going on in the UK, just a small thing. Now, country number two, normally country number one, I wanna give a shout out to China in a segment called What's Up Beijing? No intro needed. They're not the main event this, this week. China may be banning clothes that hurt people's feelings, causing a bit of blowback. <laughs> so what does that mean? Here's an example. This is a police officer detaining a woman for wearing a kimono because there's a bit of anti-Japan sentiment right now in China. And if you're wearing something that, that is pro-Japan, it could be seen as a problem. Now, the pushback for this is pretty severe. A language on the new proposed amendment is so vague. <laughs> it's basically wearing clothing or symbols in public that are detrimental to the spirit of the Chinese people and hurt the feelings of Chinese people. What could be counted as an offense was not specified and it can result in tensions or a 15 day fine. Now that's really tough to, to crack down on. Uh, obviously this is banned, <laughs> but that was already banned. So this is an additional furthering of the law that has people concerned. You know, I think the biggest concern is that low 
local police could apply this at different levels of strength and some might go way too far. You know, for example, there's been censoring of men wearing earrings. There's been censoring of people with colored or dyed hair. There's been censoring of men wearing anything that could be considered feminine clothing. And all of those things would fall under the police's right, not necessarily would always enforce it, but they'd have the right to crack down on it. Hopefully they back down on this. Again, they have responded to public outcry in the past, like with the COVID lockdowns remains to be seen. That being said, economic news, uh, there's a win and a fail. Now the fail is that exports continue to fall. As I've said, it's a rocky time economically in China and overall exports for China have fallen for four straight months, which is not good for the world's factory. That being said, there is one export that is thriving. China is flooding the world with cars. Even as China's other exports falter, its car makers are seeing big increases in overseas sales for gasoline and electric vehicles. China is becoming an absolutely dominant player in automobile manufacturing. They are zooming past Germany. The main story that I found out from this, there was a Volkswagen executive, Volkswagen biggest automobile creator by volume in Germany. They have a new CEO and he dispatched an executive to China to examine what was going on. And he's finding that VW, which normally had, you know, big sales in China is getting absolutely leapfrogged by BYD, a local Chinese company. And Chinese electric car companies are smashing monthly sales records again and again. And they're knocking on the door of Japan, which is the world's largest auto exporter. Now, if you're American, I don't think you're going to notice this because China sells absolutely zero vehicles here in America. But Europe is seeing an influx. Australia is seeing an influx. New Zealand is seeing an influx. All of these countries are seeing a massive influx of Chinese vehicles. For example, there is a, a video going around that China has these fields of unsold electric vehicles. This is 100% true. There are are thousands, if not millions, of electric vehicles unsold. Most of these, though, are from 2017 because China, as you may expect for a company where EVs are so rapidly growing, has like 400 EV brands and a lot of them suck. But the companies that are winning in China are becoming more and more powerful and they are selling EVs globally at a great cost. And also, the battery technology in China is proving to be better than other countries that are trying to do battery technology. Specifically, Ford tried to make their own batteries, couldn't and is now licensing China EV battery technology in their own EVs. <laughs> so, you know, I, I think people should just know this is a real thing coming out of China is that their car manufacturing is big. And I think Germany, when I read the Volkswagen article, is noticing it the most because they have the most to lose. Now, it's a bit of a black eye to Germany and that is appropriate because this is their leader right now who got into a, quote, jogging accident and is now a pirate. <laughs> <laughs> this is German leader Chancellor von Schultz meeting with uh, Indian leader Modi, who is appropriate as we go into our third and final geopolitical segment, What's New Delhi? Namaste. <laughs> Namaste. <laughs> and hello to India. This is such a great honor. Can India lead the world? Why not? Ladies and gentlemen, now stop. Namaskar. Thank you, uh, Eric Dupu, for that very culturally sensitive and appropriate intro. <laughs> What's New Delhi? Turns out it's a pretty big fucking week in India as they are the leader or they're, they're hosting the G20, a collection of uh, the biggest economies from around the world hosted in New Delhi by their leader Modi. Let's watch a couple highlights real quick. Handshakes. Is global trust world the leaders. Digital. One world, one family. Now, this is a big deal because uh, it's the first African time India's hosted it. And they sort of led the dialogue on a new series of proposals that the entire G20 agreed to by the end of it. So I want to walk you through it. The G20 is a collection of the group of 20, of 20 of the most powerful economies in the world. Now, some of them are kind of double counted. They count the European Union as one, but also the UK and France and Germany. And so they represent, I believe, 85% of global GDP, 75% of global trade trade and two thirds of the world's population. It's probably the biggest and most powerful economic group in the world. And India was chosen to lead it because of a couple of reasons. Number one, massive expansion. All right, India's economies have seen unprecedented growth. They have a rising middle class. They've got increasing foreign direct investment. And most importantly, they've got way, way, way better demographics than China. <laughs> now you can see here, this is an estimate of population based on 2050. You'll notice India has already passed China to become the world's most populous country, but also so they are way younger. Now you can see how lumpy Chinese demographics are. This is partly because of the one child policy 
and partly because they've had a dramatic drop in birth rates. China's getting way, way older <laughs> and way grayer and has an imbalance of like 20 million more men than women. India, complete opposite. And so also because of geopolitical tensions in China, again, there's like America, China sort of Cold War standoff. A lot of companies, Apple to Boeing, are moving their manufacturing to India. Now, I don't want to make it all seem positive. This is all like over 20 to 30 years. It's looking pretty good as a growth story for India if nothing changes and if they sort of improve on some key metrics. I want to be clear that right now, as we speak, India has a lot of problems. India has a ton of poverty and India has a ton of corruption. Basically, there is a huge amount of bribery. You know, America, we have bribery called lobbying. <laughs> that exists in, in India as well. But they also have like localized bribery where people supporting small businesses at every level feel like they have to bribe to get by. There's a lot of bribery built into the system. And for the G20, you know, it's a big moment for India. They kind of wanted to ignore that. So <laughs> India in the shadow of Modi. But as the nation plays host to the gathering of the G20, India is hiding away what it doesn't want the world to see. Slums are being cleared and huge nets suspended over them. Poverty We're just... swept <laughs> under the rug. Because there was so many world leaders coming into the city for the G20, they just put up big tarps to hide the slums. <laughs> which is kind of insane. They're saying foreign ministers are coming. I don't know which countries they're coming from. People like us don't have much information. So that's obviously going on. There's still a long ways to go. And if they can't solve those problems, then the growth might sputter. But the story still seems positive. It still seems like they're headed in the right direction with, with growth. Now, that being said, the main story for an American from the G20 might be more about this guy. <laughs> Sleepy Joe was on a mission at this G20. You see, the G20 is the most powerful economies in the world, but two countries that are part of it didn't show up. Russia and China. <laughs> Xi Jinping decided to skip the G20, possibly a snub to India. Joe Biden swooped on this chance. You see, uh, we're just a few weeks ago, there was the meeting of BRICS, which is kind of the rising alternative power to the G7. Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. Xi Jinping was sort of pushing this group to grow and become a, a voice of the global South. Well, <laughs> at this event where Russia and China didn't show up for some reason, Mr. Steal Your Bricks showed up, dude, and took this strangely picked photo. Why? exactly these countries. Biden, there's 20 countries here, but the Rizzler out there picked exactly the countries of BRICS. <laughs> this is Brazil, India, and South Africa. The other three, along with the United States. He also tweeted this, basically creating what you might call BUSI, B-U-S-I, a counterbalancing force to BRICS. I don't know. I feel like he's trying to make Bussy happen. And I think he's choosing the right time to do it. Again, there was some dissatisfaction from India that Xi Jinping refused to show up to the G20 when it's sort of their year. Again, a different country hosted every year. This was India's year and China didn't show up. And there's a rising amount of unfavorable opinion. Again, in India, over 60% of respondents said they had an unfavorable opinion of China. And it's about half in Brazil. You know, India right now is playing both sides, but seemingly there's been an opportunity for the US to swoop in and sort of peel them away from I think the BRICS plan that China was hoping they would take part in. Now, next year, this same thing might happen even more exaggerated because another growing economy, Brazil, will be hosting next year. I like this picture a lot because this is whenever you pass the ceremonial gavel from one leader to the one that's going to host it next time. I might be reading into it, but it looks like he's really gripping onto that fucking gavel and does not want to hit <laughs> As far as I can tell, everything I read about this, this was a kind of a slam dunk for Modi. Whatever you think of him, this event went really smoothly. It went really well. The countries agreed. We're able to condemn violence. They even got Russia to agree condemning violence, even though they're currently in the middle of a war. But one thing that was suggested by Modi and actually happened was the inclusion of a new member. There is now a new member of the G20, the African delegation. Basically, India said the global South needs more representation at the G20 table. And so now there is a, basically like the European Union has a, has a representative. All of the African nations have an African union. They have a representative of the G20 and they now have a vote. So now the G21 really, uh, as far as I can tell, Modi's idea that he pushed for and got consensus and it happened and it happened at this event. So it is progress. Now the one world leader that kind of looked a little silly was Canada, who apparently got kind of roasted by Modi at one point and then his plane broke and now he's still stuck there. <laughs> Not a huge deal, but I thought it was funny. <laughs> but that's it for this week's Marketing Monday Wins and Fails. A longer one and a, and a more geopolitical one. Hope you enjoyed. We'll be back next week with more Wins and Fails. Tune in every Monday. Thanks for watching. Check it, check it.